everyone. Sorry, we had a little technical difficulty there. Uh, I'm Chelsea Castle here on the Lavender Marketing Team. Really excited to share our special guest with you today. Uh, we're talking about copywriting and sales, and we have Tara Horsemeyer joining us. Hi, Tara. Hey, Chelsea. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you today? I'm fantastic. So glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Of course. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm really stoked to have you. I know you've been off the grid for a little bit, so we're really honored to have you back and joining us today to talk about writing. Okay. My favorite thing. So everybody knows like, hey, this is, you know, if you're going to pull me out for anything, it's going to be this. So I'm so excited, like I said, just to be here and hanging out. Yeah, me too. So we're both journalists. We both have former journalist backgrounds. So I think you'll appreciate this, that we don't like to bury the lead with these lives every week. We really want to start off with what is the number one most important piece of advice you have for writers and listeners who want to get better at copywriting and sales? What would that be? Gosh, so I always like to demystify labels. And this is one thing, especially when we're talking in sales and we're talking with somebody who didn't necessarily say, hey, I got into sales because I wanted to write or I wanted to be a copywriter. So the first thing I always say is let's just remove that label. And remember, it is all about using our words to connect. Like we are ultimately connectors. And when we bring copywriting into sales and when we actually write in sales, what we're doing is we're just continuing that connection. So whether it's taking your product or service or whatever you do, connecting the dots to how that helps the other person, you're a connector. But same thing, when we talk about copywriting and sales, we're using our words to do that. We're both connecting, again, our product or a solution to their pain and their problem. But we're also trying to use our words to connect with them. I know we'll talk about this more, but to connect with the person on the other side of the screen, of the email, of that communication piece. So when we remove this idea, oh my gosh, I have to be a copywriter now and add that to everything. And just remember, we're just trying to connect. We're trying to use our words, use our language in such a way that actually connects dots and connects people. I think it becomes so much easier to say, oh my gosh, I get it now. And I get that this is a skill that I really want to cultivate. I love that. You're a connector, not a writer. That's so that's so good. And, and you know, I love that. You're thinking about the human on the other end. Um, but especially, you know, it can be, I think, intimidating, right? If you're a seller and you have a certain experience and then all of a sudden you have to write a whole lot. I think copywriting can be an overlooked skill in sales. And I'd argue it's one of the most vital skills. Um, can we talk about, like, I'm curious what your thoughts are and why specifically uh, it's so important, that skill. Well, when it, it, you just nailed it, how much of our time that we spend thinking, okay, I'm going to do all these other things in sales and I'm going to be talking, I'm going to be on in demos, I'm going to be closing deals, I'm going to be doing all that. And then we sit down and we're like, oh my gosh, like 80% of this is actually writing. It's follow-up emails. It's putting things in a CRM. It's, you know, texting. It's um, being clear with our communication with our um, CSMs, or it's obviously reaching out. If you're in an SDR role or a full, full cycle AE role, you're trying to go, um, you know, talk to somebody and uh, move the needle. You're really trying to do that. And then when we sit down and are like, oh my gosh, there's so much writing in this. I had no idea. So when I actually was doing um, a little bit of research, thinking about why this was so important, specifically when I was leading SDRs and helping them kind of understand like, hey, this is going to be a big piece of your role. I want you to know this going in. Um, I found a term and a definition that I absolutely loved from Copy Blogger. And it is literally, it defines copywriting as the art and science of strategically delivering words, whether written or spoken, that get people to take some form of action. And so if we remove copywriting from that definition and say sales communication, sales communication sales is the art and science of strategically delivering words, again, written or spoken, that get people to take some form of action. Then I think we've really hit the nail on the head where everybody is like, you know what? You're right. I actually need to learn how to do this better because when we learn how to write better, and I will always say this, we learn how to communicate better. We learn how to verbally communicate better. We learn how to understand people better, but it really starts with slowing things down and learning how to get from um, thoughts in our head to not just just out of our mouth, but really get them down on paper because that clarifies so much of what we're trying to do and forces us to slow down. But it ultimately impacts, I feel like 90% of our, even maybe up to 100% of our role ultimately uh, when we are very clear and compelling writers. That's such a good quote. And honestly, like that answer, I think should, or and I hope 
really eases any fears that people have or like the anxiety you can feel when you're going to write because that was just like so so helpful what you just said I think that's really important um I'd love to dive a little deeper into that so when we talk about um why it's so important to be um you know, good writers and sales, but especially like what you just said made me think about um, this line that Will Allred says all the time that thinking or writing is thinking, right? Mm -hmm. And it's just a muscle that we have to keep practicing. So if you feel like you're not good at it, if you feel like you have that anxiety, it's just like a muscle, right? Like you're not going to feel super strong the first time you go to the gym, but as you keep working out, the more and more like you lift, you know, or whatever it might be that you're doing, that muscle gets stronger and then you can add more weight and you can keep flexing. So I think that's really important to you to remember is it's practice is important. Um, and then to your point, you know, we're better communicators and that I think ex extends verbally too, because we're practicing that muscle of thinking and communicating when we're writing. And then that makes our cl us clear communicators, which helps us in sales across mm -hmm. the board. Absolutely. Yeah. It's why it's one of those things that I never realized that that was going to be my background as a journalist helped me so much in everything that I did in sales. Cause I'm like, it's, it really just all works together when we understand that we're just communicating. It looks different in different scenarios as we use it. But I do think that one of the best things that we can do is remove that anxiety around it. And so mm -hmm. it helps people just do it so much more natural. I agree. And no one really teaches us how to do these things. <laughs> you know, no one really teaches us how to email or at least when they do in college, at least when I was in college, it was very formal, you know, dear sir and madam. And you certainly don't want to do that. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, that actually makes me think about some of the most common writing mistakes that we see in sales. I'd love to get your thoughts on like what some of those common mistakes are that you see in email specifically and how people can work through them. Yeah. So one, and, and I just want to preface this by saying I have made and probably still make you know, one or more of these mistakes. Um, you know, it's just, it's a we, like, that's why I love always educating and just reminding everybody, like, this is a we thing. We all can sit there and, you know, hit, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. But when we really remember, hey, we're all learning as we go. And sometimes, you know, after a while, the don'ts become the do's. But I will say traditionally, all of these will... Uh, we all struggle with them, but hopefully we get to the other side and can say, hey, let's stay away from these a little bit. And so the number one thing that I see that I have been guilty of is too long. And if you follow me on LinkedIn, you know, I like to write, like I like to write some long posts, but when it comes to uh, cold emails or outbound or things like that, do not, no, 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 no. So um, most of the, the emails that I receive that I'm immediately like, no, it's not because it wasn't, um, didn't have the substance or form or whatever. I don't know because it was blocks and blocks of text. So I know it's an mm -hmm. obvious one, but it's something that we constantly have to fight against is being uh, too long. Another what, big one is no relevant or context. Like I have no idea why they are reaching out to me personally right now. Like there is it just, it's nothing about um, connecting the dots again to why they're reaching out to me personally. So making sure that it's relevant again, not to this long uh, list of names, but relevant to me personally. And then um, a lack of compelling next step. This is something that I can definitely talk about um, a little more, but sometimes I get emails and I literally have no idea what to do with them. <laughs> you know, it's either they're an educating email and I'm like, is this a newsletter? Um, and I'm not talking about, oh, um, book a meeting with me here or do you have 15 minutes to chat, but truly a compelling next step even if that next step is, I don't want you to take a next step. So being really clear about the intent of the email, um, it, it's just so helpful and it helps remove the burden of your reader trying to figure something out on the fly quickly. And then last, but I don't want to say not least, but one of the big ones too is it's all about them. It's all about them and their company where I literally feel like an ad just popped up in my email or uh, wherever I, you know, a, a DM or something. And it has, again, it doesn't connect the dots and it doesn't connect to me personally. And uh, that's great. <laughs> it's telling me all about them and their company. But if it has no context for me, then it just completely goes in the trash. Yep. Same. That mental spam filter kicks in. Totally. So to recap, too long, not relevant, lack of compelling next steps, and it's all about them. So I guess people can work through them by being writing more concisely. So mm -hmm. we can talk more about that. Our data shows that 50 words is about the optimal length to increase your chances of getting a reply. Can we talk a little bit about uh, any tips you have on writing concisely? You know, that can be really hard. I also, as a writer, you know, writing a blog post versus mm -hmm. writing an ad copy is it's hard. It's actually harder to write in fewer words. Yes. Um, so what sort of tips do you have to help people be more concise? 
So be your own editor. Like that's one of the biggest ones. Um, read things out loud. And if you find yourself having to take a breath in between what you're saying, specifically when you're trying to get it short, then it's too long. So, um, and a lot of us talk fast. So you can fit a lot of words before you have to take a breath. But that's a huge test for me. I read things backwards sometimes. That's the editor in me. Um, and, you know, and I say, okay, does this not, does it make sense? Obviously going non-sequentially, but essentially, and um, am I missing something here that I either need to add or is this so where it doesn't need to be here? So it tricks your brain into just reading things the way you want them to read versus how people, um, not that people naturally read backwards, but it forces you to really break things up and say, is this necessary? Do I need this? Um, instead of just going on autopilot and skimming things. Because again, we're skimming something. So we're flying through an email, but they're reading it. If it's the first time that they've read it, they're obviously going to skim it to see context, all of these other things. But if you want them to actually read it, it needs to be short. So those are just a couple tips that I try to run myself through. That's super helpful. Reading out loud, for sure. I would recommend doing that for anything that you write, but I never thought about reading things, like reading things backward. That's really smart. That's helpful. Um, we also said not relevant and how important it is to connect the dots between what you say. Um, we often talk about emails um, like Legos. So if you think about building Legos, it's kind of the same thing, right? Like everything kind of has to connect to each other and make sense. Do you have any other tips there on ensuring that emails are relevant? I mean, this really just goes back to assessing your who, like knowing who you are reaching out to. And again, I know being in the SDR and having, you know, at least like you just you get a list of companies and you get names and it's so easy to just fly through things and think, OK, because they all have this exact title or they're all in this uh, industry or something. So this must be relevant to them. And instead of taking the time and I am a big effectiveness over necessarily efficiency when you're starting out um, and especially as you're getting to know your ICP and the industry and all of that, of really understanding who you're reaching out to front and back. <laughs> so a lot of the relevancy and a lot of things, it may end up disqualifying some people before you even reach out. And in, in, the more you do your homework and the more, again, this is one email going to one person knows that, hey, this one person on the other side of the this email or on the other side of this communication is asking, why are they reaching out? to me personally, right now, like why now? Why me? And those are the two questions that they're going to be asking. And if your email does not answer it, it's not relevant enough. I love that. And honestly, I kind of want to bring that back to our journalism roots again. You know, when you're in journalism school, one big thing they teach you is the so what factor. Your know, yeah. readers are selfish. We don't have a lot of time mm -hmm. as humans. Our attention spans are short. So when we're reading something, anything, we're always subconsciously thinking about why should I care? Why should I keep reading this? What value does this give to me? What does this have to do with me? Which is so mm -hmm. critical for emails. So that's also where like being really short and to the point is really critical and just yeah. instantly like making it relevant, connecting the dots, but also like getting to the point so that the reader hopefully gives you their time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you also said lack of compelling next steps. We also, we tend to like to talk about, you're not asking for the, that are time, the meeting right away. You're not pitching your product right away. You're trying to start a conversation. So what other tips do you have to kind of end that email in a way that there's some compelling next steps there? I think the biggest thing is anytime that you can evoke some kind of curiosity, it's going to, you know, again, for the most part, that's like one of my favorite things is just being curious, having that posture of curiosity, but also leaving just enough to where, like you said, this is one of my favorite things to remind myself, even we're not trying to sell the entire, part. we're just trying to get one tiny next step down the road, just to open the conversation because right now you're not in a conversation. If this is the first time you're reaching out to them, you are literally in a monologue, <laughs> but your goal is to get into a dialogue. And so um, not assuming anything and always making sure that your tone is curious or that you're evoking some kind of curiosity of, is this interesting? You know, is this something enough that leads them to at least hit that reply button? And obviously not like a bait and switch kind of thing, but really having something compelling in there to where they want to just learn a little more, just, you know, understand a little more. Maybe they're not, um, not saying not clear about something, but maybe you've left a little something that just re requires a two-way conversation 
And that will lead them to say, to reply. And then you start the conversation and then you can dig in from there. But that was always, especially as I was starting out, like I aimed for that reply. <laughs> like, what can we do to just start the conversation and, you know, make sure it's compelling and not a negative way, but um, really a positive conversation. And then we can fill in the gaps as we go, because now we are in a conversation. And that to me mattered more than, oh my gosh, did they book a meeting right now? <laughs> mm -hmm. 100%. It kind of connects to what you started out saying in the conversation earlier around remembering that there's a human on the other end. Mm -hmm. And so often when we're behind our computer screens, we don't behave the same way we would if we were face to face. Yeah. You know, you want to just like walk up to someone at a party and be like, hey, do you want to go on a date with me? Or do you want to like go hang out and be friends? Like you want to do that. So it's kind of the same thing. It's just like act like you're just trying to start a conversation with a stranger and then think about how that applies in that particular medium. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, I, it's, it's huge. Yeah, <laughs> it's it really people. is. Yeah. I also love that you said don't assume. I'm on like a really big don't assume kick lately where I'm encountering a lot of sellers and you know, as a buyer, I'm encountering a lot of people who are being very assumptive and it doesn't feel good. But also our data shows more importantly that when you're unsure, unsure tonality will increase your chance of getting a reply. So I'm curious if you have any other um, like tips there, right? I think you have a phrase that you often use. I'm going to remember it correctly. Like you want to like know, like, and trust. Am I remembering that correctly? Can you talk yeah. a little bit about that? Well, um, so when I actually, when I write or, or help people with, you know, brand strategy or different things that they're going to, I always remember that um, it's a continuum. And that's what you have to do, especially as a seller, is you can't, you've got to build all of that. Somebody's not going to trust you the first time. You know, we're just hardwired and especially as journalists to be skeptical, to find the questions under the questions. But um, the more that we can move people to know us, obviously like us and, and like doesn't always mean what we think it means. It doesn't mean, okay, warm, fuzzy, you know, fairy tales, but truly say, okay, I like what you stand for. I like what you're doing. And then ultimately trust us as in, I, I believe in you as a professional, you know, I believe that you'll do what you say you'll do and that you can actually provide value to me, or at least have a conversation to move me toward um, getting rid of this pain point or whatever it is that you're offering. Um, so when we can help people move toward those in conversations, it's really going to help. But one of the biggest things that I see to your point with assumptive and tone and posture is so many people just want to move to that trust piece automatically. You know, they forget that this, it is like dating, <laughs> you know, it is like warming up a little bit as in, um, I don't expect somebody to immediately say, okay, yes, you know, take my money, go run. That would be great. And we would all be millionaires if that was how it worked. But it does need a process of over time, you're going to develop some kind of um, communication and boundaries and understanding that. But it never starts when someone is assumptive, when they're rude, when they're condescending. This is another thing. And I know for the most part, when I'm getting a condescending tone in the email where they're trying to educate me on my faults or failures or pain or whatever it is off the bat, it's going to be off-putting because we naturally don't want to see all of our blind spots. We want to have a helper, not somebody coming in and beating us over the head with all the things that we're doing wrong on the first, you know, communication or even in the beginning of a process uh, before we establish that trust. And then we're in a different kind of relationship where now I'm transferring my um, ability to look at you as a trusted advisor, but we're not there yet. And so, so many people want to rush to that and end up coming off, which I know they don't mean to, which is probably rude and condescending and just off-putting um, instead of taking a warmer approach of understanding there's a no like trust thing going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that trust is really important and hard to build. You know, you mentioned dating, but also, you know, just like starting a new friendship yeah. or you start a new job and then you're building a rapport with people. Mm -hmm. I think it's helpful to think about that relationship building because mm -hmm. when you when you consider what that looks like, I think that can also put into perspective what you're also doing as a seller mm -hmm. with, with strangers and prospects. I think that can be helpful. And I see <laughs> a lot of sellers also like the intention I think is usually good. Yeah. Um, they're usually asking a question that might sound assumptive. It'd be off-putting, but the goal is to learn more, right? You're trying to learn more to then be like, well, we can help with that or to, to have a jumping off point. So I think one way around that from a messaging perspective um, is instead of like assuming being like, 
Well, I see you have content, you know, like your marketing team has content. Have you, have you ever thought of repurposing that content? Even like that kind of question mm. can feel a little, mm. um, I don't even know if assumptive is the right, do you know what I'm saying? It's like even a question like that, like you're assuming that the team yeah. isn't doing something that yes. is kind of basic, Yes, but yes. you can kind of see the <laughs> intention, right? Yeah. So maybe one way around that is to ask the question uh, in a different way where mm -hmm. you're saying a lot of, of our, you know, a lot of our other customers um, use our tool to repurpose content, like curious what your thoughts are about that. So just like yeah. just spinning that question so you can still get the same outcome that you're trying to achieve and just like twisting that tone. Yes. And I think um, one of the big things that you try is, is moving from a yes, no answer. Like this is always one of those things is to not automatically disqualify yourself. And so, um, you know, if they can automatically answer yes or no, that's not really, again, a starting a conversation. That's just, you know, a mental, yes, I have thought about this. No, I haven't. Versus if, if you see, if you ask, have you thought about this? That's a yes <laughs> or yeah. a no. Um, versus, hey, what are your thoughts about this? Now we're actually getting a dialogue and we're getting to the reasons underneath certain things. But I mean, I do love that when you do, I think the one that's uh, most people or a lot of people, have, it's those obvious things. And I think Will just said that too about, um, you know, when, when you're so, when you're trying to be too high level <laughs> in a sense of like not knowing your audience of, of course, if they're in content, these are all the things that they are. And even if they haven't, they're, they might be like, oh my gosh, I actually haven't thought about repurposing, but you've, you automatically have elevated their thinking and elevated your opinion essentially of them to say, of course you have in a way, uh, of course you've thought of this. Well, what do you think about this? Um, and so you're moving them on in a conversation that they maybe have, been, have not even had about themselves, but you're not making assumptions in a way to where they might feel dumb. And we don't want our prospect Anybody, I mean, friends, we don't want anybody to ever feel dumb when we're talking because now we're back in that condescending box. Yes. Yeah. That yes or no question call out is super helpful. That's a good one. So I want to shift a little bit. Oh, actually, I forgot another point. So your your other point earlier when we were talking about common writing mistakes was making it all about them. So that is probably like the number one mistake that we see for sure is it's all, it's easy, right? You know, when we're trying to pitch our own product that we're talking about ourselves and our company and our product, um, how do you recommend people from a messaging and writing perspective? How can we shift the, like who we're talking about and what does it actually look like in writing? It's hard. Yeah. So I know you guys talk about this a lot, but that's um, moving. If, if we're doing too much I and me, <laughs> this, then that's already a red flag, you know, and, and we want to make sure that what we're saying says, hey, we know about you. We know about, I mean, the majority of what you write about should be as uh, making the point that you know who they are and that you are reaching out for an actual reason and a point. And then once you've established that, then it's great to say, well, this is why I'm reaching out because there needs to be a reason. It's not just, hey, I'm just noticing this about your company. Great job. It's like, okay, notice this, you know, see the observation, all of that. But then now this is how what we do actually ties into you. So even the, the educating and the what we can offer you or provide you or how we can, um, you know, fix this pain point or solution that we do, even that actually comes back to you. All of this, this entire email is about you. And that's how we want them to feel to where it's a natural next step to where now they feel like, okay, I'm being talked with and I'm being encouraged to enter a conversation because they have shown that they care about me essentially. And care doesn't have to be, again, lovey-dovey or loosey juicy, but has taken the time to understand me. And when you take the time, that communicates care automatically, subconsciously on every human level. If I get an email that I know somebody has taken the time, has done their work, all of, you know, relevance, check the boxes, then I'm like, uh, heck yeah, I'm going to answer, you know, or I'm going to get into a conversation because, I mean, they've shown they care and that's what we do. I love that. Yeah, showing you care. It's like, how can you do that in a way that's it's appropriate, you know, in a cold email. But to what we've what we've kind of been saying throughout the whole conversation is remembering that there's a human on the other end. Mm -hmm. yes. And I'd love to go into that a little bit more. Yeah. So especially when you think about SDRs, you're often given templates mm -hmm. to work from. And then you have to take this template of words and then make it your own. It can actually be harder for some people mm -hmm. to take already written words and then figure out what to do with them as opposed to writing something that new, which can also be hard. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on like 
how can you take a template specifically and make it your own? How do you apply your personality and your own voice as a seller to something that's already written? Or just how do you do that at all? It's so hard. It can be very, it, it can be so hard because you want to infuse personality. So the first thing I do is take a step back and always remember that, you know what, it is so easy for me to hit delete on something that I feel is a templated, um, pasted, you know, cut and paste sent to a million people. I mean, I, it's so easy to delete. What's hard to delete or at least not respond and engage in is a person. Like you don't just delete people. <laughs> you know, that's why I love videos too. And I love mixing things up and showing things, you know, showing my face and bringing my personality into tonality into things that I can, because it is a lot harder to ignore. We're hardwired to uh, respond to people. Same thing with our email. When I feel like, my gosh, there's personality. Somebody put, again, their time, attention, and care into this. It's going to be a lot harder to delete. Not saying that you don't, or we still don't, but at least it's a step in the right direction. So one thing I always say is take that template or take, you know, obviously assuming that you've got a little bit of freedom here and a little bit of flex to make it your own. And what I do is I pull out the main bullet. So I just move it almost to an outline of saying, okay, I don't need to write this or say the script word for word or whatever, but take out, okay, what do I need to communicate? How do I need to communicate it? What's the bottom line here? What am I trying to get them to do? Because remember, it's the art and science of moving them to take an action. And like it or not, every single person is going to take an action at the end of the email. You don't want it to be delete. You want them to actually take a next step to think about it, sit on it, maybe forward it to a friend, whatever it is, you want them to do something positive with it. Um, but what you can do is, again, I'm all about when we say putting our voice in there, literally put your voice in there. So take the bullets and then just spitball it, like take out your phone, put up your voice notes and just say it. Like, how would you mm -hmm. communicate? that, internalize it, and then rewrite that email how you would say it if you were sending it to a friend or you were sending it to someone. Go back, edit yourself, you know, send it to a colleague, something like that, to just start to learn how to put your flair, your way of talking, your way of communicating. Again, those bullet lines and bottom points, but adding your um, your personal touch to it, whether you're a little bit on the warm, you know, more on the warmer side, if you're a little bit, um, you know, I say humor, we can, you can kind of do that depending on context and what you're doing. Obviously, it's not going to work for everybody. But um, anyway, any way that you can infuse your personality and humanity in there, it just makes you unignorable. And that's really what we want. Mm, unignorable. That's perfect. So good. Um, I love to also think about that advice in other areas of the email. So yeah. thinking about like subject line, preview text, signature, et cetera, like we mentioned, dear sir or madam, how can you strike a balance between you're not being too formal, but also not being like, okay, like, hey, bruh, like, how do you strike the right balance? But I love your advice, though, about like, how would you say this to a friend and then maybe scale it back? Yeah. But absolutely. how do you find that balance too? It's hard. It can be hard. It, it is. It's doing exactly what you said. You know, maybe it is. Okay. How would I say this to a friend? And maybe that applies to your CTA or maybe that applies to a different part of your email or the opening hook or something like that, where you can kind of bring in a little bit of levity or lightening it up, but then quickly get into, again, not the trusted advisor piece of, we want to be condescending, but we want to be curious, warm and open. And that's what I love about um, the, the, just the best cold emails is that they are none of those things, but there is a, an element of warmth to it as in you're trying to warm up this cold outreach, uh, this email that they were not expecting, <laughs> you know, today in their inbox. And so you're trying to warm it up a little bit and using your personality and words as a way to do it. So um, subject line, I am so with y'all. Keep it boring. <laughs> like Keep it, um, again, unignorable because it is easy to ignore all the spam um, subject lines. So I would say absolutely keep it boring. If you can evoke some curiosity, uh, do it in the preview text, you know, because you know they're going to see it. And so um, bring it, you know, make it sure it's personal. Make sure they know in those lines you are talking to them specifically. You're not talking to an email list. This is not a newsletter. This is talking to them. Um, and then when I get to the opening hook, pull them in, you know, make it so unignorable again to where they know, oh my gosh, this was written directly to me. They know this is me, even if it's written to, you know, a lot of people, of course, but like them. Um, but it's about them. And it's one of those where it's like, hmm, they're in my head, you know? And then the body, is it jargon free? Is it easy to read? Does it have white space? Is it uh, compelling, <laughs> you know, to and interesting enough? It, whatever you do, there is some great way to spin it that's interesting, that just doesn't feel like, you know, paint on, on dry paint on the wall. Um, and then again, always that call to action. 
everybody wants to know. And when we read emails, a lot of us skip to that end right away. What are they asking of me? What do they want to do? Make sure it is, I think you guys talk, I know y'all talk a lot about this, the, the low barrier ask and something that's compelling, but also clear. <laughs> Let me know what you want me to do and why I should do it right now. That's perfect. And somehow we're already at time. That was super helpful. I had like so many more questions. I could talk about this all day. Um, but I think that was a great way to end it. This was so helpful and hopefully it was helpful for everyone else out there as well. Thank you so much, Sarah, for joining us. And we'll see you all next week on Laminar Live. Bye.